We are here again. We're back again. I, I cannot tell you uh, how excited I am for today's wonderful episode of Rebel Scientist with our incredibly talented, uh, probably one of the most important humans on the planet, Sarah Turner. How are you? <laughs> thank you, Ross. Yes, very good. Thank you. Good, good. I was just reflecting on some of our past episodes around chronobiology and the the ticking the ticking clock within our bodies uh and the mind and the body connection and saying how my how just my life has changed just over these last 10 12 weeks together uh and i'm so excited for today's episode because i think we're going to be bringing another amazing person to this world yes indeed we have a treat this week because we have my dear friend dr marvin berman who's going to talk to us Amazing. I promise. Well, there he is. Here Hi. he is. Dr. Berman, how are you? Good morning. I am fine here in chilly South Philadelphia. Well, Philadelphia is the the capital of of the uh the old world of the United States. And uh I I'm curious to see how long have you lived in Philadelphia? I moved here from Greenwich Village in 1977. Wow. Well, you've had a couple of baseball and a football championship in there or two. Yes, absolutely. And lots of uh, traumatic brain injuries along the way. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's probably a great segue (laughs) into our topic. Sarah, uh, yeah, why don't you, why, I'd love to, you know, hand it over to you and let you and Marvin, uh, you know, talk about our wonderful topic today. Sure. Well, the reason that I wanted uh, Marvin to come and speak to us today was because we've, we've spoke a lot about some of the theories behind like light and the brain and things you can do to kind of help your brain along. But um, Dr. Marvin Berman is a, a special character because he's actually been doing the research into this field. So uh, he's the person who's going to have the most direct experience because I think sometimes the theory is very different to what you actually see in practice. And so if we want to know what it's really like to do some of these things, you know, Marvin's the man we need to speak to. So what I would like you to talk about, Marvin, if that's all right, is one, you know, the research you've been involved in, but, but more importantly, you know, what was your direct experience or, or how did this actually work you know, in real life. And I'm talking about the light and the brain in particular here, but I know you've done a lot of different things. Sure. Well, um, my background around the light and the brain began with the uh, exploration of quantitative EEG and something called neurofeedback, which I think you've covered a little bit. Not so much. So if you just did a very quick summary... I'll give you the the back of the napkin. Neurofeedback is simply a form of biofeedback, which is the use of some form of measurement technology to quantitatively measure a physiological function and then provide feedback to the person about that function. So with heart rate or blood pressure or skin temperature, you would be getting very direct measurements and you could then modify your own physiological functioning in some way by getting this feedback. And the learning process then allows you to gain what would be considered instrumental control over what ordinarily is thought to be autonomic functioning, but then becomes clear that it's not, and that we really can gain control over physiological functions uh, using some form of technology to give us some some guidance. So what happened originally with biofeedback was that people were using peripheral measures, 
And then in the late 50s, early 60s, they started to recognize that you could also gain some measure of control over central functioning or brain activity by monitoring electroencephalograph or EEG activity of the brain's electrical firing uh, by measuring it with electrodes that are placed on the scalp. And I was barely aware of any of that in, in my clinical practice until I met someone who was doing this brainwave biofeedback training. And it became very helpful to me in my practice as a psychotherapist. So the idea was to monitor the brain activity and then compare that activity to norms that had been established in a normative database by age and gender. And we could then use operant conditioning or reward conditioning to give people feedback about how their brain activity was going and move it more toward what was considered normal. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the that's the general back of the napkin idea. Okay, so, so how then did you get involved in this kind of fairly out there concept of shining light into people's brains? Well, it turned out that when we started doing research on the neurofeedback, we looked at neurology's data and saw that they had become very clear on what happens to people when they develop dementia and that the slow wave amplitudes, the, the slower brain waves, the uh, voltage of those went up and the faster brain wave voltages went down as people became more demented. And we started doing research along those lines. And in the middle of that research, I got an email from one of the subjects, husbands, and the subject line was, what the hell is this? And I looked and opened it up, and it was a cover photograph from the Daily Mail in London in mm -hmm. 2008. And I was like, well, this, this guy is like a research scientist. What the hell is right. he doing reading the Daily Mail? I mean, really, like the Daily, you know, it's like the National Enquirer. We anyway, all need to know what the, yeah, we all it's a very know auspicious what journal up to. in England. I get, I get, but this wasn't even like a naked lady or princess die. Anyway, I, I know what you mean. But the, the question for me was, was this for real? I mean, it, it's the, the cover, the, the headline was UK researchers reverse dementia using infrared light. And I went, oh, my God, he's really desperate. Right. And then I looked and saw that, in fact, mm -hmm. it wasn't an article by the Daily Mail. It was an article about a journal paper that was published in the British Journal of Neuroscience. And I went, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> and then I read the paper and then I read the references. And mm -hmm. then I realized that they weren't kidding. And I went back to the guy, the husband, and I said, so you know, do you, do you want me to go to England and get one of these gizmos for your for your wife? And he, being a guy with a lot of zeros after his name, said, oh, well, see if they'll come here. So we did a study. We, we I wrote a, a note and I called the guy up and he came and he brought with him a helmet with arrays filled with LEDs that had that were all matched to 1,070 nanometers, and the lights were set to pulse at 10 hertz. And we put the helmet on this guy's wife's head, and we did it every day for six minutes in the morning and six minutes in the afternoon. And we did neuropsych testing before we started. So we wanted to see what would happen. And about three weeks into the process, my uh, research assistant, Ashley, came back in tears. What's the matter? Oh, my God. I, I don't know what happened. She was so upset. Who was it? Mrs. Ha Mrs. She was upset well, about what? Oh, she started yelling at Mr. Haas and saying, oh, why didn't you get consult with me about, you know, your your decisions that we're going to go see our son in Oregon? And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Did she say all of those? Was that like in a sentence? She, oh, God, they were in such a fight. Wait, what do you mean? If I, oh, she was like really angry. I said, mm -hmm. wait, she was expressing emotions? Yeah. And, and, 
And I was like, what, what are you talking? She was like, I don't know what happened. And then all of a sudden the phone rings. I pick up the phone and it's John. And he's like, oh my God, she was so pissed. I can't believe it. I've got my wife back. <laughs> That's brilliant. I, I find I'm, that, well. Uh, uh, I'm sitting there yeah. holding the phone, you know, and then like, what do you do? You look at the phone and you're like, what the hell is going on here? But now, was there right? any regrets? Did he say? <laughs> no, he was beside himself. He was he was over the moon. This you is know? incredible. This is incredible. And and we kept going, and we you know we're kind of like, okay, this is really happening. But what it what it said to me because when I started looking at what photobiomodulation was and what this what the light was actually doing. It was a tissue level intervention into the pathology that was taking place. It wasn't, it wasn't biofeedback because one of the things we found with the biofeedback research was that, yes, you could retrain people's EEG activity. You could train people to decrease slow wave amplitudes and increased fast wave amplitudes. And yes, in fact, they did improve on their neuropsychological measures. And that was great. But what we were actually doing was modifying the slope of decline. We weren't stopping anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that became, you know, that was like, okay, so this is kind of a half a loaf solution. But when we saw what was happening with this woman, and we could see that it was, and we saw that what photobiomodulation was actually doing was increasing ATP, incre decreasing phosphorylated tau, A beta 42, these other neurotoxic chemicals, and that we were actually improving the, the capacity for microcapillary perfusion. So more oxygen was actually getting to the furthest reaches of the cortex. Yes, blood flow, for those not up on their terminology. Yeah, yeah. You're increasing I, I'm blood up, flow. Yeah, I'm catching up here, Marvin. My job is to play the dummy, and because I am, <laughs> oh. uh, and to, and to dumb this down <laughs> for the too, audience I here. Too many funny words. Okay. <laughs> but but back, I, back I, I, it, it, but, but I, I think in that case, this, this is a, a very high dosage of light uh, that's applied via a helmet, right? And Yes. Um, and it increases the blood flow and it's a tissue level thing. So yes. uh, how, how, how much more light are you giving somebody than you, than, than going outside and being in the sun? If you were standing at the equator at noon, you would have to stand there for about 300 hours at noon wow. okay. to, to get what you're getting. In six okay. minutes. Okay. Wow. So uh, for the, for the listeners, uh, let me let me let me do it this way. Um, you go to the beach, you lay on the beach for the day. You do have some you do have a, an umbrella, but basically you're out there in the sun in your bathing suit for the whole day. And then you get up and you get back in your car or whatever. And you're sitting there and all of a sudden you have this that sense of kind of fullness, that buzzy kind of fullness inside your body like there's just this expansive, energized feeling. That's what you get in six minutes of putting the helmet on your head. Wow. And you do it twice and you're doing it twice a day. Twice a day. Yeah. Well, twice a day for people with the kind of moderate level of, you know, neurodegenerative disease that this person had. And, and when was this? Uh, when, when was this? When did this? When did you 2008. First... Okay. So now you're 13 years in. What are some of, what are some of the things that you've adjusted since then? Well, thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> we have now worked with the idea of intraocular stimulation. We've also seen that intranasal stimulation can have its own positive effects. But we also want to be able to now modulate the turning on and off of the lights, the speed at which the lights get turned on and off because that has a very different effect on the brain and the brain wave activity. Uh, the term is, has the term entrainment been used? No, no, you can explain so, it though. We're, we're yeah. kind of making sure we. So um, is, that being a good, is that being a good husband? 
<laughs> Do we want to talk about marital therapy, oh, Russ? Please don't. No. Okay. Okay. Let's back up. Okay. No. No. We don't have enough time. All right. All right. We could do that another time. But entrainment is the experience of the brain mimicking or mirroring incoming stimulation. So if we take a light source uh, and we place it on the scalp surface and we pulse that light source at 10, 10 times a second, and we then hook somebody up with an EEG so we can measure their brain electrical activity, we'll see that the 10 hertz activity starts to propagate across the entire cortex in response to that pulsation of light. Now, there's no mechanical pulsation. It's not like something's going tap, tap, tap on your head. It's just light turning on and off. And that is enough to cause this uh, entraining or mimicking of EEG activity in the brain. So again, if you know what normal looks like, or you have some working hypothesis about how to define normal or optimal functioning of the brain electrical activity, you can then use the light as a nudge or a drag type of intervention to try and improve the overall functioning of the brain electrical activity. And what we know from basic neuroscience is that every neuron in the brain is in fact an electrochemical system. So that if you change the chemistry of the brain, the neuron, then you're going to affect the electrical activity. That's what pharmacology is all about. Well, in fact, you can go the other way. You can influence the electrical activity, and that's going to have a very direct if impact on the neurochemistry. Now, which way you can make more money and rule the world? Well, that's, that's a whole other deal. The, but now, and, and there's a preciseness is, is there a preciseness now where extraordinarily, they yes extraordinarily and and i think for me that was really very attractive because instead of having to flood the brain with certain kinds of chemicals you could very much target and now we're seeing the intersection of these two fields with optogenetics where where you're now able to put chemicals drugs into nanoparticles that are then injected into the body. And when they reach the site, the cells that you want to affect, you can then turn on an infrared light and activate the nanoparticle to release the drug at exactly where you want it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. But wow. one of the main benefits of this therapy at the moment is that you don't need to have the drugs. You know, it is a, right. It is a toxin-free, non-invasive treatment, which I think is why it's so incredible for for brain diseases. Because right, because I mean, there isn't a there isn't a drug treatment for a lot no. of these things anyway. Well, not an effective one, mm -hmm. and with five hundred plus drug trials behind us in the in the in the trash can, we know that single molecule solutions for things like neurodegeneration and neuropsychiatric conditions and neurodevelopmental conditions are, you know, either a long way off or, hey, take a hint. This is not the way to go. So, so, the, and, and, and so this is, um, are, are there ways to be proactive with this? Is that if you start at a younger age to yeah. maintain the, you know, they maintain the, you know, your, 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 your brain in the form of a 25, well, not 25, let's say more like 35, right? 25, you're still wanting to jump out of planes. Let's say 35, where you've got some rational you're, thinking. You're giving your age away, Russ. <laughs> oh boy, I'm much older than that. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but it's a great question because um, we certainly saw that this would be an optimal model for prevention, but in, in scientific work and in the kind of academic medicine, you really can't use the P word 
until you've been able to demonstrate the T word. So you can't really yeah. talk about prevent until you can talk about treat. Mm -hmm. So we, we took that up seriously and said, okay, so now let's show that you can in fact treat neurodegenerative processes by using a combination of non-invasive, non-pharmacologic interventions. Let's see if we can actually stop the process of neurodegeneration and maybe even reverse it and maybe even stabilize whatever level of recovery we can with a combination of photobiomodulation, neurofeedback, and functional medicine. Once we can demonstrate that, then we can start to say, hey, you know what? If you took a picture of your retina with an OCT, which is a typical optical coherence tomography kind of image that you can get in any ophthalmologist's office, if you took that picture and you analyzed it a particular way, you could then measure the beta amyloid load in the retinal tissue, and that would allow you to predict the onset of dementia 10 to 15 years ahead of symptoms. Well, now, Russ, your question starts to have some grounding because now we're 10 to 15 years ahead of you starting to forget where you put your keys, yeah. let alone forgetting what keys do. Right. right. So now, sure, now put the helmet on your head. Now do the neurofeedback. Now start realizing that nicotine isn't good for you and alcohol in large amounts probably isn't such a great idea, you know, and like yeah. that. So after a rough night, you put the helmet on, you're like, I'm fine. Everything's good. <laughs> uh, hopefully. That's exactly hopefully, what you said, isn't it, Marvin? Yeah. Hopefully you don't lull yourself into that level of stupidity, but you might. <laughs> well, yeah, we I will be on those years. We will be on those years. I, 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 I think, you know, Sarah, I have one last question and I, I want to, uh, then, you know, we'll, we're going to have to close out soon and, and let you kind of, you know, finish up. What what are some of the extremes that you're looking at now and attacking? I mean, can you look at things like, you know, cat catatonic patients with Parkinson's? Are there things that you're 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 investigating now? Yeah, that's great. great. That's great. Russ. Um, interestingly enough, we did work with people with minimal states of consciousness with a group that did international consulting on that. And. I saw that you could work with people who were in minimal states of consciousness using the EEG neurofeedback and something as simple as Kool-Aid. I mean, just dropping Kool-Aid into somebody's mouth when their alpha activity started to increase. Margaret Ayers, who was one of the people who did that back in the 90s, <clears throat> she was able to bring a number of people out of long-term coma just by operantly conditioning and improving their level of peak alpha activity. So yeah, that is a, a real possibility. If she had had the photobiomodulation tools, I think we could have gotten even further with that. And it's something we certainly want to look into. Um, as far as Parkinson's go, um, we just finished a trial with our research partners at uh, Baylor Research Institute, which is part of Baylor Scott and White Hospital in uh, Temple, Texas, within the Department of Neurosurgery. We were working with the chair there, Jason Wang, and he and I divided up 100 subjects between us, and he did 60 and I did 40 where we gave people this infrared helmet thing and we sent them home with the device. And we had them using it at home on their own twice a day for six minutes. And we then had quantitative EEG and other measures beginning, middle and end. And what we saw, interestingly enough, is that the population that they used in Texas was drawn from a regional movement disorder center. So everybody had a dual diagnosis of Parkinson's and dementia. I didn't do that. I have just dementia, folks. But the point is that when the caregivers gave their reports at the beginning, middle, and end, what they were reporting was an improvement, yes, in memory and cognitive functioning, but also mood, facial expression, gait, balance, and engagement with other people. 
So we were seeing motor changes, and I've seen motor changes in bradykinesia or muscle stiffness, and also gait, walking up and down. We did a video measurement of walking up and down the hall for 10 meters. Sarah was around for that. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the, them improve somewhat. I mean, not, you know, not totally, but we were only doing it for two months. So it really was improvement in both the motor functions and the cognitive functions. So we're, we're encouraged that this is an intervention at a very basic level of neurophysiology and that anything that's mediated by the central nervous system is then going to improve. So cool, Marvin. Um, well, we, we're going to end up now, which is a shame because we could go on forever talking about this because I know there's so much more to what you've done. But let's end on, because I know a lot of people are going to ask, how do they go about doing this? You know, if somebody out there is listening and they wanted to use some of these techniques <laughs> or, you know, how, how well, would you go about doing it, especially if you want to prevent these illnesses? Right. Well, we're certainly happy to talk to people about how we do it. And they can go to the Quiet Mind Foundation website and check out what we do and the tools that we've tested that we know work. But, I mean, there are the people in, in New Zealand. I mean, the guy who put the LEDs inside yeah, of a bucket. The buckethead people, yeah. The bucket people. I mean, there's there's a huge range of people that are doing this and with all kinds of devices. And I think that, you know, it really... It really is simple in its in on its face, but I think it really bene people benefit from getting some kind of professional consultation about how best to use these devices, because where you place it, how long you use it. I mean, it's really easy to overload yourself. There yes. is a sweet spot yeah. of about six to eight minutes, and you don't want to underdo it, and you really don't want to overdo it if you want to get the benefit. So really get get a, a consultation, find out which device is best, yeah, get a little bit of coaching, really and then go. really there are a lot of devices on the market that are oh my big. goodness, well, yeah, there yeah. are there really are, and uh, it's it can be it can be bewildering for people, even me. I mean, it's <laughs> bewildering, and thank God I've had you to talk to about all of this. <laughs> Likewise, Marvin, uh, Doctor Berman, where can people find out about all of this amazing stuff that you're doing? Uh, we're at, we're at quietmindfdn.org. So that's the word quiet, the word mind, and then F is in Frank, D is in dog, N is in Nancy.org. And, um, I'm, I'm here in Philadelphia. And, uh, now that I've scaled back my practice so that I can change diapers for my new granddaughter, Fela, um, I'm around. So give me a call. Well, we'd love to have you back. Lovely. Congratulations on the new granddaughter. Thank you on uh, putting light and bringing light on the subject of dementia. Uh, amazing. Uh, and uh, say hello to Philadelphia for us. Uh, absolutely. We can do, and we can do part two sometime down the road. Absolutely. Thank you, Marvin. Thanks. That's super cool. Take care. <laughs> yeah, take care. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, Sarah, we are, you know, just to remind the audience, we're doing a seven-day challenge. Uh, and the seven-day challenge is based on Sarah bringing her friends, her rebel friends to our podcast and we're chatting with them. And then we take on this challenge. Um, so for the last week, we talked to Marvin. He is a, an, a scientific expert, uh, and using red light for some pretty, some pretty interesting therapies. Uh, a little bit tougher this time to do a seven day challenge, but. You are a red light expert, so I think it's probably a great chance for us to talk about some of the red light therapies that that we can do in our day in our daily um, our, 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 in our daily uh, work. It sounds like you need a little bit of red light there, Russ. I do. I yeah. can get that out there. <laughs> kind of winding down. Yeah. Yeah, man. The system just we shut need... down. I was like, yeah. give me some red lights. I can turn this thing back on. I got to solar power this up. <laughs> I've got this brilliant. Weirdly enough, I have got a brilliant light that it's called a Nirax band that you put around your head and then it has apps on the phone and you can choose what you want your brain to do. So oh. focus, concentrate, memory, libido, anti-stress, I think. So you just put the band on and then you select what it is you want and off it goes. Uh, what's it called? Nirax. It's called a Nirax band. Okay. Okay. Nirax band. Let's, let's. I, let, let, so let's talk through this. You, you go. You have a daily regimen that you go through with red light. 
Yeah, this one was easy. This was an easy challenge for me because this yeah. I have got tons of this kit. So I have body pads from Lumaceuticals that I and, and also NeuroCare. I've got body pads that I lay on at night. Um, and then in the day, I'm using my Nirax band and I'm kind of selecting. I usually choose focus because I usually use it in the day. And then I also have the intranasal probe from Dr. Joe DiGiuro that it's red one side and infrared the other side. Huh. Um, uh, yeah. I, also- yes. You've, I've seen you with the with the red light nasal probes. Yeah, I showed you a picture. It's not the most flattering yeah. thing, is it? Because you have this like great big red nose pulsing away. In fact, I should have sent you video because it's even more scary. Really? Uh, yeah. Does it actually pulse? It pulses? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. So how big are the body pads? Is it a full body? Is it like laying on like a yoga mat size? Yes. I Well, I have all different sizes. You know, I have one, ones that are shaped for almost everything. Ones that go into little hats. Ones that even make a jacket. Ones that you lay on your bed, ones that wrap around your legs, you know that you can get them in all shapes and sizes. The body pads. I mean, you can if you're just starting out, you can just get a small one and just kind of put it where you think you need it. Okay, so that's a good intro to those. Yeah, for sure. We've talked about this many times about the benefits of red light. Have you gone through a period in your life where you uh, were, you know, you did your daily your daily work with red light, uh, and then you you took a pause and you didn't use the red light, and did you did you see a difference in 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 your day? Well, I actually don't use them every day. Like I try and have a couple of days off because it's a bit like exercise. You know, you don't want to overdo it. You need uh, to give the body a bit of a break. So I do kind of do like five days out of seven usually. Okay. Um, but I do notice it. Yeah, I think I do. Like. Sometimes I feel a bit, you know, like, oh, I just can't get to sleep or or I'm awake a bit early. And then I realize, oh, I didn't do the pads last night. So oh, that's one okay. Of that's one yeah. of the things I notice. And, fo- and the focus one, I'm not sure, but it is quite comforting to do it on your head because it's like the little band, it's warm and it kind of, maybe it's become a little bit of a placebo, who knows. Yeah. But, you know, I feel more focused when I'm doing it because that's my, I've set that intention. Yeah, that's but right. Think, that's right. Yeah. Marvin talked about some pretty serious uh, uh, ailments like dementia, uh, um, um, Parkinson's, Parkinson's, and and have 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 there been more advances uh, in in and you've noticed that red light is now being used for for some of these for for therapy for 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 some of these um, really terrible ailments. Yeah, well, I I actually belong to a group of doctors that um, give case histories. I do it every Friday. It's broadcast from Harvard Medical School, uh, and it's always a different doctor giving a case. So I hear a lot of cases of people using red light. And I think with red light, the, the, the more you need it, the more benefit you get. So, you know, someone like you or I, you know, who thankfully we're not in that position yet that we've got any brain damage, you know, when we use it, it may, might make you feel a bit better. But for people who really are suffering with, specifically, I'm on the brain trip, but, you know, any kind of illness. But if you're ill, you've got further to catch up. You've got further to go. And so those people see a bigger benefit. Yeah. Because it's, it's there... mitochondria, you know, the sicker you are, the, the less well your mitochondria are working. So yeah. the, the more potential you have to get the benefit from red light therapy. We, we've t- talked a little bit about recovery, right? Like from injuries and things like that yeah. as well with red light. I, I, is there, you know, it would be interesting, you're with this group of doctors, is there an association that sort of leads um, the PR for this and sort of leads um, the story in making sure that hospitals know this because changing out those fluorescents and, you know, getting getting more rooms with, with sunlight coming in or actually using red light as a, as a therapy yeah. and recovery um, – I'm curious if that's something that that is needed out there, and if so, let's you know, let's lead the charge. Let's get let's the, the marketing charge. campaign well, I, going. I am totally on. I'm totally on your wavelength there because I've been trying to like get some kind of union of red light therapists together, and I actually am starting to build a kind of network. And there are other networks out there. There are groups, and there are also a lot of groups that are fighting for daylight, and not a lot of groups that are fighting for more circadian friendly lighting, yeah. like you say in hospitals and streets. So it's, you know, even on LinkedIn and Facebook, you start to see more of these posts now. So, yes, yeah. I think we can certainly help to push that along. We'll put links on there and in any way we can get involved in that, we'll do it because, you know, out of everything that we talk about on the podcast, really the light pieces 
it, well, that is you. you yeah, that is you. You bring, yeah. you bring light. We, we, yeah, you bring light to everyone's lives. And that's probably <laughs> what we should have named the podcast, but it's okay. It will, maybe we'll do another side podcast and we'll call it The Light in Our Lives, Sarah Turner. Yeah, lighthearted, feeling lighthearted. Yes. With Sarah Turner uh, and Russ. I thought about you the other day. I was talking to somebody uh, who lives in Australia and they were talking about skin conditions in Australia because of. Um, there it's, the sun is much more harmful in Australia than it is anywhere else in the world because of, you know, maybe it's holes in the ozone layer, but they have to be very careful. Are, are there are things that you notice regionally with something like that? When you live in somewhere like when Australia, where the sun is actually a little bit more dangerous, we've talked about the fact that, you know, getting early red light sunrise, uh, red light is actually a therapeutic and it actually helps, um, with with uh, you know preventing skin cancers and such, but are there things that you do in, in reg- that are regional in, in focus? Well, interesting you say about Australia because a lot of good stuff comes out of Australia now, and the University of Sydney is putting out some really interesting results. And they had a whole campaign of slip, slap, slop because you know slip on your bikini and slop on your sunscreen and hat. But actually, I think it's a bit misleading because that now they're finding it's because they had a lot of people who were just going out in the midday sun. And you're right, they do uh-huh. have problems with their ozone. But now they are starting to embrace red light as a way to prepare the skin for that for that UV radiation. And so this messaging, you know, may not have been so accurate and may have led people to, you know, avoid the sun. So now they're having vitamin D deficiencies and things in Australia. So, yeah, it's, it's a great a way to sell. It's a great way to sell beauty skin products. Well, they sold a shed ton of sunscreen based on that campaign. But, you know, yeah. what did they see? Uh, you know, they may have swapped one problem for another problem out there. So I know a lot sure. of people in Australia who are now really looking into circadian biology, um, yeah. especially mitochondrial biology. There's a lot of good stuff coming from Australia. So, yeah, I think where you, you know, what do they say? Uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. You know, they need to right. find solutions. And so they're doing it. So Yeah, that's right. Well, Thank you again, Sarah. Um, when you shine a light on my life, my my day is so much better. So thank you. A pleasure. Pleasure to say that to someone in California. <laughs> yeah. From me over yeah. here in England. If I I'd like you to send some over, please, Russ. Yeah, you you're in the mode of when the sun comes out, you try to capture it in a you know in a bottle. <laughs> like, so, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We had a bit of sun today. That's it. I was out there. That's it. Totally totally sun worshipping but yes and marvin was cool like you say a little bit um technical but it was really fascinating to see what he's doing with neurodegenerative yeah. diseases so super cool absolutely well thank you marvin thank you sarah onward onward to next week onward to next week take care us <laughs> Rebel Scientist Podcast is a Breaking the Gray production, created by Russ Eisenman and Paul Wood, hosted by Sarah Turner, music and sound editing by Logan Shea. For more information and other fantastic podcasts, visit BreakingTheGray.com. That's gray with an E, BreakingTheGray.com. Breaking the gray.